Welcome back to Entertainment Tonight as we preview the new movie, Star Trek Nemesis. George Takai was Captain Kirk's navigator on the Starship Enterprise when Star Trek first premiered. 30 years later, E.T. was there when he returned to the Enterprise as a guest star on the television show, Star Trek Voyager. Time flies so fast when you're trekking through the galaxies. Uh, no, it doesn't seem like 30 years at all. It's fe it feels like it was just, you know, a few uh, weeks ago. But uh, now that we know what it's become, it's sweeter. Takai published a book in 1994 entitled To the Stars about his experiences on Star Trek and continues to work as an actor, providing a voice for one of the characters in the animated film Mulan a few years ago. Of course, Star Trek Nemesis continues the journey begun by the crew of the second TV series, The Next Generation. For seven seasons, Patrick Stewart commanded the Enterprise, and E.T.'s cameras were behind the scenes to capture all those rare and candid moments that you didn't see on TV. I'm Patrick Stewart, and I'm playing Captain Jean-Luc Picard. The Next Generation launched in 1987. E.T. was there the day filming began on the Paramount lot. I am a Star Trek fan. I've been for a long time. Um, it's actually, it's, it's a perfect situation. I mean, it's like we've lived and gone to heaven. LeVar Burton was known for Roots and Will Wheaton for Stand By Me, but most of the cast was new to American audiences. To a long and successful voyage, the new crew of the Enterprise. Live long and prosper. <laughs> I had to put all this stuff on and become this character. And that felt wonderful. I was packing to leave to go back to England when I got the phone call that I'd got Star Trek. So my mind's been in a whirl. For Jonathan Frakes, it wasn't the first time that he had played a fantasy figure. I had a uh, short-lived, ill-fated job as Captain America with Spider-Man, where he and I would appear in uh, mini malls. Transporter Chief, do you have their coordinates? I sit in the captain's chair and uh, I say warp speed whatever, and uh, engage, and I do all of those things. The Enterprise uh, was familiar territory for Stewart. When I was an actor, first working with the Royal Shakespeare Company in Stratford-on-Avon, Warwickshire, England, after my Saturday afternoon matinee, it was my custom to scuttle home for tea time and Star Trek. Captain. Flash! But this was a new Star Trek, with Klingons like Worf now friend instead of foe. They're at peace with the Federation now, and they are working as lieutenant on the bridge. Takeoff for the series was a bit rough, but soon it was season two. Gene Roddenberry felt validated. I feel sort of relieved because, you know, Leonard Nimoy said you can't catch lightning in a bottle twice. Everyone said it's impossible to do it a second time. And, uh, and I kind of thought so too. <laughs> it's my first experience with a show that's gone into a second season. And it's great. It resembles security, or what I heard security is. In 1990, Will Wheaton left that security behind, but he made some return visits. I always have a terrific time here. I adore the cast. He saw his horizons back on Earth. 19 years old, I need to go to college. I think in everyone's lives around my age is a, is a time of transition and a time of change. The pace of that move down is perfect. The stars began directing episodes, and Patrick Stewart truly became captain of the set. Jonathan Frakes took the helm several times. Gates McFadden tried her hand, and so did LeVar Burton. Are you all right, Frakey? Only for you, Burr. If you can do it one-handed, that's no better. No, no, no. I'd do anything for my ally, as I just did. Laura's doing a great job. It just kept going and going. We're finishing, what is this, our fourth season? I don't know, Gene. If you say so, it's fourth. It must be okay. Fourth. I will agree with whatever you say today. Oh, oh. oh. well, first listen. time for everything, huh? <laughs> Humor pervaded the set throughout the show's run. We just laugh a lot, we get along, and I think that's why the show worked as well as it did, because we have a chemistry and, and love each other. These are the sunspots. I don't think I have to say anything else. So be sure that it's true. Their true camaraderie was obvious when we joined those sunspots singing backup on Brent Spiner's CD, Old Yellow Eyes is Back. Seems like a woman. <laughs> E.T. got to know the stars off screen. Michael Dorn took us flying and said Jonathan Frakes had flown with him, and Patrick Stewart said he would, but for $20,000. 
Brent Spiner, who plays Data on our show, he will not go with me for anything. Brett showed us some of his next generation memorabilia. I really, really like most of the episodes that feature the character of Data. Uh, I don't know why. I love the guy. What he didn't like was Data's makeup. Walking around in that stuff all day long, it's just, uh, <laughs> it's a pain. It really is. But he endured it and even played other characters that called for him to wear more makeup. It's like having uh... Basically, your head covered in plaster. It's very claustrophobic. Jonathan Frakes tried it too, when a scene from the show's final episode called for him to age. I'm feeling much older and much crankier. While shooting that episode, Marina Sirtis gave us a rare look inside the show's wardrobe department. This is the industrial strength Starfleet Regulation Brazier. They add inches where there are none. No, sir. Then, after seven seasons, 176 episodes, and 16 Emmy Awards, it was almost over. I'm asking you to make a leap of faith. I'm gonna miss the laughs. I'm gonna miss going on the bridge and uh, having your stomach hurt from laughing at the absurdity and the abuse that we heap on each other. Kill you, Michael. <laughs> yeah, I'll kill you. I'll split you down the middle, man. I have a certain amount of sadness, too, and it's mostly connected to all of the people that I work with here, cast, crew, producers, staff, and so forth, because um, they are simply the grandest group of people I've ever known. But shortly after, the cast began their first movie together. And with several seasons of The Next Generation now on DVD from Paramount Home Video, this enterprise is here for generations to come. Chief, take us in. Star Trek Nemesis is the fourth motion picture featuring the cast of The Next Generation. Next, we go behind the scenes for Star Trek Nemesis. Gentlemen, goggles. Patrick Stewart's high-speed stunt. A battle with the aliens. Riker's wedding. Finally got him. And why the cast is planning to get naked. Now, uh, if you'll excuse me, I'll be in the gym. As Entertainment Tonight previews Star Trek Nemesis. Welcome back to Entertainment Tonight as we preview the new movie, Star Trek Nemesis. While many of the interplanetary backdrops for Star Trek Nemesis were created on Hollywood sound stages, some scenes were shot on location in California's Mojave Desert. Only E.T. can take you behind the scenes to show you how the movie was made. Action! The film's first action sequence takes place on the planet Kolaris 3 with Picard, Data, and Worf on the run from a hostile alien race. In my opinion, Star Trek is about action adventure. It is a good time. We are given a futuristic, all-terrain vehicle to drive. Patrick Stewart has been known to race cars on occasion during his time off, relished the chance to do most of his own stunt driving. I am so psyched. I feel I'm doing the Baja 400. Isn't that what it's called? I feel like I'm doing it with him. See, Mark. Gentlemen, goggles. Director Stuart Baird made his name in Hollywood as a top editor of action films, including the first two Lethal Weapon movies. Bring the gun up. Boom, 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 boom. Of course, there's no shortage of aliens, including longtime Federation foes, the Romulans, and a new group called the Remans, a species modeled after legendary horror villain Nosferatu. Just when I thought this couldn't get any worse. And the sets are among the largest and most detailed of any in the Star Trek saga. One of the most complex to build was the famed Enterprise Bridge, which made use of a new design feature. I said, well, I want to build a set on a gimbal something that you can move left to right and up and down and all over the place. So instead of the actors pretending there's movement, there is movement. Over the years, you know, we've been used to the cameraman shaking the camera and all of us, you know, doing this. This time we were being thrown around. All hands brace for impact. Three, two, one! The producer spared no expense on the production, which took nearly four months to film. The script was written by John Logan, who penned the Oscar-nominated movie Gladiator. 
I absolutely grew up on Star Trek. Right. Great. And from the time I can remember being alive, Star Trek was part of my life. And to have a chance to get in and start shaping some of that mythology and being involved with bringing that story forward a little bit was a dream. The main enemy ship is the creation of computer graphic imaging and was designed to be menacing, appearing three times larger than the Enterprise. At its helm is Shinzon, Picard's evil alter ego. I'm very lucky that I get to play the villain because he is scary. I'm a mirror for you as well. Not for long, Captain. I'm afraid you won't survive long enough to witness the victory of the Echo over the voice. I like the idea of Picard confronting himself and yet not himself because the other Picard had developed quite differently because of his life experiences. Rumors about the plot were flying nearly a year ago when E.T. was on the set, with one saying not only does Captain Picard die in the film, but that Patrick Stewart helped write his own death scene. Contributing to a death scene for Picard? No, that's, there's no truth in that. No, Picard doesn't die. Well, at least on the pages I've gotten. <laughs> but there was one rumor that did turn out to be true. Riker and I finally got him. Well, you know what? I should say, he finally got me. Yes, there's a wedding. Riker, played by Jonathan Frakes, and Troy, played by Marina Sirtis, get hitched. This was a wedding in a beautiful location. Wonderful, romantic, not to say dramatic location. Um, there were some surprise appearances at this wedding. The happy couple even wear their real-life wedding rings. Frakes got his from wife Jeannie Francis. My lovely wife gave it to me. My real wife. My nighttime wife. The first of two ceremonies takes place on Earth, with a second plan for Troy's homeworld of Beta Z, which has the crew feeling a bit uneasy. It seems the custom there is for all participants to celebrate in the nude. Don't worry, number one. We'll get you to Beta Z with plenty of time to spare. Thank you, sir. Where we will all honor the Beta Zoid tradition. Now, if you'll excuse me, I'll be in the gym. So will audiences see the Enterprise crew in all their glory? You'll have to wait until the movie opens to find out. It seems as though we are truly sailing into the unknown. Coming up next... Beam me up, Scotty. Candid moments from the other Star Trek movies. I can't imagine Star Trek going on without Mr. Spock. The day Spock died. Kim Cattrall, long before Sex in the City, and what got the cast in ice cold water. As Entertainment Tonight continues. Tonight weekend birthdays are brought to you by Don. Which star of Lois and Clark once guest starred on Star Trek The Next Generation? Is it Dean Kane, Terry Hatcher, or Lane Smith? Your answer is coming up in the E.T. Weekend Birthdays. Welcome back to Entertainment Tonight as we preview the new movie, Star Trek Nemesis. Can you believe it? Over the years, the Star Trek movies have grossed more than a billion dollars at the box office. And now, with a whole new generation of fans, one thing is clear. There simply is no final frontier. Beam me up, Scotty. We're ready. Mark! Star Trek made its first voyage to the big screen in 1979, two years before Entertainment Tonight's first broadcast. The first one was supposed to be the only Star Trek uh, movie. That's why it was called the motion picture. But that made a ton of money. That led, of course, to a sequel, The Wrath of Khan. By then, in 1982, E.T. was on the air, and that began our long relationship with the Star Trek franchise and its creator, the late Gene Roddenberry. I certainly don't intend to stop striking blows. There are a lot of issues and challenges in the 80s and 90s and uh, the end of the century that need talking about. Three, two, one, ha! In Star Trek II, Khan, played by Ricardo Montalban, had to learn how to fake an attack. You count one, two, three, and we all, you know, try to simultaneously feel the impact of the hit. That's not easy to do. In the film, a total newcomer made her acting debut, Kirstie Alley. It was great. It was my first job. I was very grateful, don't get me wrong, and I really wanted to do it. During production, there was big buzz in Hollywood that Spock, Leonard Nimoy, might die. The set was shrouded in mystery. I can't imagine Star Trek going on without Mr. Spock, uh, and I don't think there's any reason to even conjecture that there won't be a Mr. Spock. There are several possibilities. I don't think we even know what the hell we're going to do. And sure enough, Nimoy was around for number three, The Search for Spock as star and director. He told us at the time what a daunting task he had taken on. 
And you walk by a stage and you see 40 guys out there hammering hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of feet of lumber going up. And you think, what is that? And that's, that's the thing that you okayed on a piece of paper. In the story, our heroes must brave a Klingon army while searching for their Vulcan friend. It's being advertised in the commercials that I've seen just recently as the final voyage. The final voyage? Not likely. The voyage home was the fourth film in line. We were landed in San Francisco in the late 1980s. The story found our intrepid cast stranded in hot water. Well, extremely cold water, actually. Each little drop of rain was like a, a sheet of ice. The famed Paramount B tank was filled with water, and with ETs and Star Trek's cameras rolling, they added wind and rain, thrashing waves with smoke and lightning. It really feels like you're in a real storm. Of course, our friends survived for The Final Frontier with the first time director, William Shatner. Cast and crew of Star Trek V. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Wishes you all a very happy, enterprising New Year. Everything in my life has been a preparation for this moment. Nothing could beat the experience of writing, directing, and acting in a motion picture. And directing Spock did have its perks. Thank you. It's joyful. One of the best experiences of my life, telling him to move left and move right. That was great, Bill. I'm glad you thought this up. The Undiscovered Country, released in 1991, had parallels to the recent fall of the Soviet Union. The Federation attempted a peace with the Klingons. Because the Klingons always were our evil empire. Playing Spock's Vulcan understudy was Kim Cattrall as a brunette. I feel like a, a little elf. You know, when I look at myself, I feel sort of impish and elfish the way I look. But uh, there's a lot going on. She's a smart, smart cookie. Sexy and smart. There was by then the undeniable feeling that this would be the last Star Trek movie for this cast. More importantly, the studio thinks of it as the, as the final Star Trek. Uh, so it is. We're working our way through a goodbye here. Star Trek Generations did bring new blood to the franchise, led by Captain Picard, Patrick Stewart, as he accepted the past torch from Captain Kirk. I don't see how we could have made a movie without them, so I'm thrilled that it's, that it's turned out this way in every possible sense. Deep in the aptly named Valley of Fire near Las Vegas, E.T. was there as an epic fight was staged between Shatner and bad guy Malcolm McDowell. Seven, Seven eight, nine, nine ten. ten. They squared off on a tiny rock 200 feet above the desert floor in 100 plus degree heat. I've done a lot of fights, but I've never been uh, on a rock like this. I mean, uh, this is uh, scaling the heights of fights. Entertainment tonight, but this afternoon, it's work. Patrick was taking his lumps too, all the while bonding with his predecessor. In addition to having some fun on a, on a movie, uh, even in this rarefied atmosphere, I've made a friend, and that's equally important to me. Here, here. Red alert, all hands to battle stations. Engage. By first contact in 1996, the new cast was well relaxed in their roles. Engage. <laughs> it's potentially so silly to be uh, dressed in spacesuits and pretending to be in the 24th century. that We have no choice but to get uh, silly between takes. I'm getting close to hysterical now. While battling the evil Borg Empire, First Officer Riker, Jonathan Frakes, actually directed the film. Best job in the galaxy. Especially when I get to wear both hats. Action. Two years later, Insurrection again had Jonathan directing his duly respectful cast. Now, which one is Jonathan? <laughs> is he the big guy? Their battle to save an ancient civilization swelled the actors with pride, but not the first look at their action figures. The eyes are blue. That's... I wear these yellow contacts for 11 years, and they put blue eyes in this thing. But Picard's crew has one thing in common with Captain Kirk's. The years spent together saving the galaxy time and again has turned them into close friends. It's like being paid to attend a wonderful party whenever we get together again. And the next chapter in the series, Star Trek Nemesis, opens Friday, December 13th. We'll be right back. The Entertainment Tonight weekend birthdays are brought to you by Don. Celebrating a Trekkie-style birthday on Saturday, see Thomas Howell turns 36, Priscilla Barnes is 48, and Ellen Burstyn is 70. Blowing out candles on Sunday, Kim Basinger turns 49. David Carradine is 66. And which Lois and Clark star once guest starred on Star Trek The Next Generation? 
That's Terry Hatcher, who celebrates number 38. For more details on Star Trek Nemesis and for all the latest Hollywood news, just click onto our ET website 24 hours a day. We leave you now with a preview of our show next weekend when we look at the latest Hollywood secrets and scandals. Take care. See ya. When did you know I was the final one, Larry? <laughs> when, you, when, you, when you think you have arthritis, it better be the final one because there's nothing left. <laughs> Having her is like, just, we're like one. I never had that. There were definitely signs of uh, eating problems. She would uh, eat grilled cheese sandwiches for six months in a row for lunch, and that would be all. She came to me for help. I said, there's de something definitely wrong with me, she said. I, you know, I had my face lifted. I, I eat well. Um, you know, I, I stay really busy. Um, I try to learn new things, you know? I'm past the ice cream years, yeah. That was when I was very stressed out and I just ate ice cream. But I thought, you know, if I ate nothing else but ice cream, that maybe it would work. The ice cream diet would work, but it, it really didn't work. It wasn't a good idea. I would say it was Playboy. I really would. So it was not just a happy gig going to Hawaii, throwing off your clothes and saying, wow, we look at me. When I shot the cover, I was in tears the whole time. I had the little jacket on with my hat, and that's all they really had to cover my body. And I was wearing nothing underneath the jacket. So they, they were touching me up and doing things. I just couldn't believe it. I was just, I was just appalled at what was going on. It was the single hardest thing. Um, I think not, because in acting, you expose a lot of yourself.